America's jails house more than 500,000 inmates. An estimated 350,000 of them are part of a complex segment of the population with a mental illness and life circumstances that render them homeless, addicted, and without medical care. In McLean County, about 28% of the 230 inmates routinely held at the jail have some form of mental illness. Some inmates wait months for the long-term care they need. You can meet me out on the edge of town Be yourself and not be found Meet me out on the edge of town I'll sing a song and you can sing it out loud Bring a smile and a few good friends And a pocket full of cash that night will never end Meet me out on the edge of town I'd have to say the most challenging part of having a mental illness, such as uh, bipolar or schizophrenia, is, is there's no real stop to it. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's a continuous thing that I have to deal with every day. In October of 2012, McLean County Board Chairman Matt Sorensen told the Chamber of Commerce that the county jail had become the largest supplier of mental health services in the county. For probably the last three or four years, you've heard me talk about how the McLean County Jail uh, has been, or has become, and continues to be the largest uh, mental health facility, uh, you know, in McLean County, in terms of, uh, you know, the, 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 the day in and day out, the stressors on the systems uh, that are caused by mental health and behavioral health uh, challenges. I was in McLean County Jail, and they said, and I, I don't remember, I only remember bits and pieces of exactly what happened, but for, uh, for a long while I, I, I thought I was somebody that I wasn't supposed to be, you know, like, I thought I was God, I thought I was, you know, an evil angel, stuff like that. This is the story of how Sorensen and others are leading McLean County to stop punishing its mentally ill population, and how they are beginning to find a more effective way to deliver health care. The last time I went to jail was uh, about a year and a half ago, and I ended up, shoot, um, I, I, I had surmised that my parents didn't really care for my well-being, and I went into a rage, and I took knives out of the doors and stabbed the walls and tried tearing down a banister and, you know, punched and kneed holes in, in the walls and stuff like that, and they called the police, and the police came out here. The state press charges on me, not my parents. Um, so the state kind of took control, took control of the situation, and uh, um, I ended up going to McLean County Jail, and I stayed there for s six months. Six months. The McLean County Jail ends up being kind of the 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 place of last resort for uh, police officers on the street to uh, deposit people, so to speak, uh, that, that don't really uh, qualify or there's no room for them at a hospital. Uh, the police officer can't really leave them at home or wherever they were uh, for fear that they would be of a, uh, danger to themselves or to other people. So they end up in the county jail. The single-person cells keep inmates under the watchful eye of officers, but the constant commotion of the area does little to help with their mental health conditions. I was in booking the entire time. They asked me if I wanted to go up there, and I wouldn't. I wasn't cooperating with people. I wasn't. Um, they they said we can try to get you um, into like a block where where I would be in general and where in general population, but. Um, without cooperation and without, you know, <laughs> without cooperation, I didn't really get that far. We started tracking and observing back in probably mid-2011 uh, the increase in inmates with mental health illnesses. What we did was took that to 
the county administration and county board chairman to express my concerns about the jail. The mentally ill inmates that we have in the jail, we house them in our booking area um, in the observation cells so that we can spe pay special attention to them, give them the extra observation that they need. The hallucinations hadn't started until about a year and a half ago. Um, they, uh, I, I used to have a lot of problems with depression where I wouldn't want to get up and do whatever. You know, I wouldn't want to work, I wouldn't, didn't want to play, didn't want to, I just wanted to keep to myself. Despite video surveillance, corrections officers at the jail must walk through the booking area every 10 minutes, look into each cell, and check an inmate's well-being and determine if an inmate shows intentions of attempting suicide. Basically, you know, it's to protect themselves protect them from themselves and protect us from them. Um, several, on several occasions, they may be suicidal you know, or homicidal. We do the assessment if, if, they're, if we're capable of booking them in, meaning that the individual is being somewhat cooperative. We'll complete the booking process. The sergeant on the shift, and, and if it's during the day, our, one of our assessment specialists will come down and speak with the individual. If he's a violent individual, we'll just kind of set him off to the side in a cell, uh, put whatever, whatever restraints we need to put on him or her uh, in order for them not to hurt themselves or staff or other inmates uh, until such time we can get our counselors in here to deal with the individual, uh, our psychiatrist to evaluate the individual to try to diagnose what may be his illness uh, and, and then move forward from there. Changes have been made in how the jail manages violent inmates. One scene is the ultimate solution for violent offenders. The quiet room is no longer used by correctional officers. A mobile restraint chair is available for out of control inmates. This used to be our quiet cell, padded cell. I don't know if you've ever been in a padded cell, but they feel really cool if you want to come in. Like I said, it does smell weird. It reminds me of when I was a little girl and I would catch lightning bugs and then my hands smelled strange afterwards. But the floor, you know, it's padded. Um, we did find out that we were getting some chipping in, of the paint, so we didn't utilize it as a quiet cell anymore because they would come in here and eat the paint. Yeah, it wasn't good. When we actually put somebody in here, you can see you've got these little divots, so if you have them handcuffed behind your back, it's a little more comfortable for them. We're, per policy, not allowed to do that. They have to be handcuffed in the front. Um, so sometimes when they sit in here, um, their legs will go numb because it's was tilted back this way and then they'll wet themselves, you know, just because that's what they do, because they want to make things more and more difficult for us. But then they end up sitting in it, so I don't even know why they do that. We have shoulder straps that go across their chest um, this way. We've got a nice little waist strap that secures them in. And on the sides, we have these uh, pretty nice soft restraints so that they don't hurt them, you know, their wrists. They can, bang all they want and nothing happens to them. And then we've got the same thing for their ankles and their legs fit nicely in those little rounded spots. And then we have this nice padded strap that goes across to keep their legs from kicking out any further. Um, what we do sometimes have to do um, to keep them in the chair is we'll take a set of our handcuffs on each side and we will loop them through. And this is like I said, some of the creative stuff we've come up with. If an individual comes in and they're in a crisis, which I think is different from having a, an, a mental health episode, uh, if they're in a, a crisis situation, we will make the phone call to our community provider and try to get the crisis team in the jail. And I remember, um, and a lot of people are like, this is, this is, the, this is, this is the ultimate solution. This can control anybody, anything that they're doing wrong, this is the ultimate. And I don't know if you and I were partners or if I was just your supervisor at the time, but we had a kid that it wasn't the ultimate because what he decided to do was to start biting pieces of the inside of his mouth out and spitting them on the floor. 
And I'm thinking, you know, out of all the things that we we you know planned for. Yeah. Yesterday. Uh, in our indoor rec room, we had an inmate with mental health illnesses diagnosed that was having an issue. Uh, went into what I would say a, a crisis mm -hmm. and started yelling at, at the bricks in the wall and, and, and things just weren't going good for him. So in order to protect the inmate, uh, we had to utilize the correctional staff to restrain the individual uh, so that he wouldn't hurt himself, other inmates, or, or the staff. And it took six correctional officers uh, to able to, to be able to subdue, restrain, and remove uh, from the rec room, getting back in his cell, uh, and then report that to our psychiatrist and, and our counselors to see what we can do to get this individual calmed down. <laughs> The benches. Somebody, I guess, if they were pretty small, could probably sit up on them. But typically, like I said, people are just laying down on the floor. Come on in here. This is what they consider my office oh. that I share with all the other sergeants. Down in booking where you were before when all the officers were going around doing the checks, these are all of the cells. Each tag represents one inmate and the different colors are just based on charges and things like that. Um, so like I had told you, we had that empty cell and then that other, that drunk guy had come in. I don't really know what his name is, but we would take his tag and we would move it over here if that's where he's going to be. So this is the special needs. All of these other cells this one uh, can house one person. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this quiet is where we just came from that had the chair in it. So we've got seven special needs cells. South holding cell, north holding cell, those are those cells right out there. Lieutenant Greg Allen views a proposal for a new mental health unit as a benefit to staff and inmates alike. These, the mentally ill, still have rights. We have to take them to recreation. That's the part of the problem is they're down here and we have to move them all the way upstairs to have recreation. And then if they have a, some kind of an episode, then you've got to get them all the way back down here. So uh, a new facility or a, a, a redesigned facility where you've got all that in one area will be a, a big help to, to us and, and anybody that's trying to take care of these type of people. They usually try to move you in. You, when you're in jail, you you stay there for X amount of time, and then when you leave, you get you get your treatment. But they do have counselors there that they can talk to you. But it's not like they can actually medicate you or diagnose you or anything. Basically, the only places these guys can't see be if someone's using the bathroom, showers, things like that. After an appointment with a jail contracted psychiatrist, inmates receive medications for mental health ailments. We have a contract with a psychiatrist for four hours every two weeks. Uh, on an emergency basis, we can call him. We will consult with that, our psychiatrist, immediately. Sometimes what, what complicates that issue is that if we get somebody in that has a severe mental health illness that has not been diagnosed or under a provider's care, we have to start from the beginning through the assessment had the psychiatrist come in and perform an, assess, uh, an assessment, diagnose what the illness is, and move forward with medication. Good job. Thank you. You banging on your door? Yeah? What you doing that for? What you doing that for? 
You bored? Yeah, we need to get you a haircut. You're starting to look like Santa Claus. The wall, and I know all they have, you know, it's time, but he had actually taken that entire thing off the wall. And, you know, somehow we just, we had found it, and it was like... The last time that I was there, the hallucinations took started taking taking hold, and I didn't have any any um any gumption to to actually get up and and uh, try to do anything to keep myself busy. Good. Do what? Yeah, I think now's your time for your dose to increase, so. Because you know you're on the stair stepping method. Love it. Thank you. They ended up sending me to Chester because I refused to go to court. So they, at some point, picked up on that I was going crazy. Like uh, that, I had hallucinations that something was terribly wrong with me um, through the little communication that I did have with them, and they ended up sending me to Chester because um, they they sent me upstairs to court, but I didn't actually attend the courtroom. I think my dad was there that day, but I didn't I, I didn't I didn't actually. Um, but um, there were a number of. Um number of officers that uh, in McLean County and even in Chester that, uh, you know, an instance in McLean County when one of the times my uh, Daniel didn't want us to, to be seen and my wife and I were there, it's like, okay, fine. And we were walking uh, straight around the corner and one of the officers came out, chased us down and said, he changed his mind, he'll come see you. Now, the visiting time is, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes over a phone and a little screen. So, he didn't have to do that. Um, he didn't have to come chase us down for that particular little 10 minute block that we had at that time. And this is before he went to Chester. Um, and they would come and they would ask uh, and we would wait because they would give him the chance to say, okay, your parents are here. Let us know. Do you, do you want to see them? Do you not? Take some time. And we would wait, and there would be times he would say yes, and there would be other times he would say no, and we'd, we'd be on our way. We brought in the National Institute of Corrections uh, in January of 2013, I believe, uh, to do a mental health assessment on the jail. And of course, the results from that assessment teamed up with a second assessment in July through the NIC Department of Justice, kind of confirmed that our concerns were legitimate and we needed to move forward with looking at a different way of housing individuals with mental health illness. This was our first assessment that was back in January of 2003. One of the, the main concerns that we recognize is that there was a, a two-month delay uh, with, with inmates with mental health illnesses being released from the county jail, two month delay uh, in, in getting follow-up services through our community provider. When you have an inmate released, there's this stigma that, you know, they've got offender or inmate trying to get this person's competency re restored. You know, when yeah. people get arrested, they get arrested and they come to jail. But if we could turn these people over into a place where they could receive help that we can't give them, it would free us up from having to you know, tie up all these resources that we tie up at this point. When I went to Chester, it was Freemasons this, Illuminati that, you know, heaven and hell, all kinds of just craziness. Like I, like I said, I thought at one point I was uh, supposed to be a female angel and I was sent back to do something for God or I was God at some point. And um, my hallucinations were akin to that. That's what I was hallucinating about. Is I thought there was um, monsters that were going to come kill me. I thought there were 
you know, the devil was out to get me and I thought I sold my soul or, you know, my soul was going to get taken away from me. And nowadays, when the voices in my head kick in, that's usually what they have to talk about is that, that kind of stuff. But I can, I, I'm now able to dismiss that as a symptom rather than actually living a part of it as a, as, as a life experience. Well, I think our county board has recognized that it's just not a jail issue. It's a community issue. And on the community side, if we're making the improvements in the jail that are necessary for us to better deal with inmates with mental health illnesses, we also have to look at the community side and the delivery of services that are available. You have to look at what's provided through the mental health tax levy. Uh, and of course, that's public dollars uh, involved there which falls under the control of the county board. They established the, the levy. So actually the county board it has forked out in the two different directions. One is the jail, uh, the needs assessment in the jail and what we need to do to improve services through a mental health unit. But they're also looking into the community side and what services are being offered because it, it starts in the community. The McLean County Board took the report from the National Institute of Corrections seriously last year. Chairman Matt Sorensen appointed two advisory panels to study gaps in local services and find ways to address them. The federal study said the county lacked a mobile crisis team, cooperation between service providers, and a place for people in crisis to go, other than the jail and homeless shelters. The old saying has always been, we have to be tough on crime. Uh, but I think it's switching to we have to also be smart on crime. I think we've, we've clearly articulated that, that our issues with the jail, our, our concerns with the jail capacity are, are a symptom of a, of a broader community problem, not the community problem in and of itself. That said, uh, it, it is inevitable that we will likely have to do something with the jail. Well, I think we, th there are a couple of risks. One is, the first risk is that we're not going to improve the situation if we do nothing. The second is that now that we're aware of the way that we are housing inmates with mental health illnesses, which are different from our general population uh, through CRIPA, which is the uh, Civil Rights for Institutionalized Persons Act, since we're housing them differently from general population, that puts us in violation uh, under that code. So to do nothing again would mean that we would be in violation of federal law. Um, whether that's a, a massive construction project to uh, you know, to add a bunch of bed capacity or a mental health unit or, or whatever the case might be. Um, we saw an opportunity while our advisory groups are working, while the county board is kind of making its way through this issue, uh, to at least get ahead of the game and identify, I think identify four or five different potential building options uh, or remodel options uh, for the county jail. And we went ahead and, and contracted for preliminary engineering to, uh, to give us an idea whether or not uh, the, the cost of all, any or all of those projects, you know, and, and it's not going to be exact. Uh, it, we didn't ask it to be exact, but we need, to, we need to know if it's, you know, bigger than a mouse and smaller than an elephant kind of a thing. As the community examines how mental health services are provided, the McLean County Board of Health considers how to divide up local tax money for a crisis team. The Center for Human Services is the historic provider of those services, but recent criticism has raised issues about how the agency responds to emergencies. We had clients in the emergency room for a week because they were so difficult to place. Um, there was one young man who was developmentally disabled and deaf. Nobody wanted to take him. Um, and so part of it is just finding a, an appropriate psych bed to put them in. The psych units have become very, um, I don't want to say selective, <laughs> is, the, is the right word, in, in who they can treat. And it's like I understand that because if you're running a 24-hour unit, you can't have like my, somebody like my grandmother there and then some other young person swinging things around, you know, throwing things. So, so the psych units have pretty much downsized. And well, specialized. We spend a lot of time in the emergency rooms now. Um, it, it, it can take hours. We go through a whole list of hospitals that we contact. 
hospitals are playing games too. It's, uh, it's so it's like I'll call you back because they want to see who's in their emergency room. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it can take hours in the emergency room. Like a medical it, matching game? It's kind of a yeah. medical matching game, an ugly medical matching game. One of the things that we try and do in the emergency room with the emergency room staff is keep that client calm, you know, get them a glass of water, get them some, a meal or whatever to keep them calm because it is a long time just to sit there and there is no, there's nothing in that emergency room. Like they're, they're in their room except a bed. Public statements from CHS have been uh, because uh, cuts have prevented from serving more people. Uh, can you explain the coverage of the crisis services? And this is public information that was stated, so if it needs to be clarified, it says that they went from two on call now to one, and that they only have two on call at peak times. Is that accurate? At this point in time, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So where is the access? I mean, staying. Um, the majority of that excess income has to do with return on um, investments that we have. Um, it, so it's it's not from health department funding, um, if that makes sense. Well, I mean, from health department, but it shows access in crisis prevention. So right. again, that's it from, from what it shows mm -hmm. here is that there is an access. So I mean, they, they continue to say, well, we, we don't have, you know, funding's going down, but they still show access monies in the crisis a portion of that um, so. and, and that and that's from gain on investments and if you if you look at a 990 from three or four years ago you'll see that there's um, a decrease there's a loss that year because there was a significant decrease in investments um, so it has to do with um, our investments and if they have a gain or a loss well what was it about a month or two ago um, so when I went in and um, I was three minutes late because I was three minutes late and they put, turned me away they said they were so busy that day anyhow I had talked about killing myself I was so upset just I said you know what if so what I kill myself you know this is not on you guys for Harlan Cameron and Lori Berg the connection to their doctors and medication is a lifeline that keeps them stable as they live with a mental illness both women said they were turned away from the McLean County Center for Human Services when they went for help the denial came when she was mere minutes late for an appointment to renew her psychotropic medication. The accounts shared in these stories are counter to the recent public assurances from the center that the poorest and sickest are the highest priority for staff. Officials from the Center for Human Services could not comment specifically on any client issues, but said the incidents are not typical of the care provided to their patients. Didn't have any problems uh, really with the center, except for, you know, when you go and you're a couple minutes late, um, they send you away. Um, that's happened actually quite a few times to me, and there's been times I've needed medication, like her case here, uh, and they tell you, it's very, like when you go back to talk to nurses, it's very crucial that you let us know if you're even close to being out of medications because of we we both have almost the same problem. We, we're so bipolar, you know. We'll you know you have to. We have to have our medication. And then I go to my friend's house this morning, and she is in tears. And I say, well, let's just go up there. And I guess maybe you could. T they treated her terrible. I mean, they they hung out with me three times already this morning. So I told them I was coming up here, and then when I come in there, that nurse comes. She's just rude, rude, rude to me. Bad. You know, and I said, you know, what am I supposed to do? You know, I gotta have that medication. Am I supposed to leave here and nut up? You know, cut myself. See, yeah, I'm a cutter. You know, I, I gotta have that medication. And I seen the doctor yesterday. Oh, you're supposed to call two or three days ahead of time. I was here yesterday. That's how they make my appointments. I see the doctor the day before my prescription. Her excuse for hanging up on you was well. I not get a word in that. Yeah, advice. I was trying because she wouldn't let me finish what I was saying. So, you know, like this morning, I called, um, like I said, like three times, and I'm trying to, you know, explain to them that I got my prescription, the doctor increased my dose yesterday. When I went to go get it filled, my insurance will only pay for two a day instead of three a day. So I couldn't get my prescription filled, which leaves me out of medication today. So I told them I need them to rewrite the medication, either back down to two or increase the milligram, you know, so that the insurance will pay for it. 
And um, they're like, uh, well, you know, we, we got all these other patients. You know, we don't got time to deal with your problem right now. You know, we'll get a hold of you in several days. I said, several days? What do you mean several days? I can't go several days. What am I supposed to do in the meantime? Am I supposed to nut up and go cut myself? You know, is that what you're telling me? Well, we'll get to you when we can. It, it might be two or three days. I can't wait two or three days, but two or three days, I don't, I'm going to be pulling my hair out, maybe uh, cut my, who knows? You know, I don't know what I need that medication. I take it for a reason. Get a word we might be us. hard to deal with, but this is the reason we need our medication. If yeah, you can honestly exactly. see, we talk, oh, this is, mm -hmm. we have issues. We're not, mm -hmm. they're not going to just go away. And the medication is probably the only thing that, uh, we're like this, but our medication, at least it helps us be a little more like this, you know? I mean, and we're never yeah. going to be completely and, and normal, but it without, helps. Yeah, to go without it, even for a day, to, to miss a dose is um, very hard on us. It can help us. They can't, they can't fix for Yeah, we know they can't of, fix our problems completely. Uh, they know the, the stuff that's been done to us and the way that our minds turned out. I mean, all they can do is help us with medication and therapy and, you know what I mean? They'll never fix it. But that med yeah, the medication is our, our lifeline because without the medication, who knows, we, we could be dead. We yes, could be, yes, we could right be off locked time. up in a facility, you know, for longer periods of time. I mean, you know, we could, that's what we take the medication for, to try to keep us stable, to cope with everyday life. County Board Chairman Matt Sorensen is optimistic that the community is serious about making the necessary improvements in mental health care. I, I think the uniqueness of our approach is, in our case, you know, county government who I guess technically really doesn't have a responsibility specifically for the, the, the mental health, behavioral health issues and, and those kinds of things, uh, has stepped up and said to publicly that this is a quality of life issue in McLean County, this is an economic development issue in McLean County, this is a, you know, if, if we don't handle these issues well, um, it's a bad thing for almost every sector. A second agency, Chestnut Health Systems, is seeking the county funds to open a new crisis center. Um, so for the uninsured or for people who are Medicaid eligible, that service just in, in any form, whatever kind of detox we're talking about, has really not been available in the community for several years because budget cuts just cut it out of our service regimen probably five, six years ago now. As to why Chestnut's involved, I'd have to say it's for the same reason that we got involved with the federally qualified health center in providing primary medical services, which we had not done before. We saw a need and nobody else was stepping up to the plate. And we have the experience of doing this in Madison County, St. Clair County. We have a director who ran exactly this kind of program in Rock Island County. Um, so in the absence of some other organization stepping up and saying, we'll do it, mm -hmm. the community needs it, so we stepped in. And if the community wants us to provide this, we'll uh, try to bring the same kind of quality service that we've done in, uh, in other communities and in this community for 40 years. People living with a mental illness also have ideas for ways to improve mental health care. It's clear that treatment is more difficult behind bars. The one thing that I've noticed that, that any facility doesn't do is listen to what the people have to say. Like, when I was in jail or when I was in Chester, I would try to cry out to somebody for assistance and tell them what was wrong with me. But they, it's, it's, it's hard to describe. It's like they tried to diagnose it their way, but I don't know how to describe it. They, they just never really listened to what I had to say. Like, if I would sit there and tell them, you know, well, um, I can probably take this medication better if I eat more. That they usually, at McFarland, they have that option. When, when, you, when, you, when, you, take, when you end up taking up so much medication, you have, um, 
it, it'll eventually start like affecting your body and you know some of the medications used to give me restless leg syndrome and I would have like aches and pains or twitches in, in, in my body and it, it, when I, I knew that when I ate enough I didn't have that problem but with but you know of course in jail they didn't they don't give double portion Jason Reeves was shot five times by an off-duty police officer who was working as a security guard at a grocery store in Normal, Illinois. Police say the suspect was armed with an air pistol and pointed it three times at a security officer before the officer fired nine shots at Reeves, striking him five times. Reeves had used the pellet gun during two previous robberies. A psychiatrist hired by the defense deemed Reeves insane during the March incident, and a doctor retained by the state agreed that the suspect lacks the mental capacity to understand the three robberies were criminal acts. Officials believe Reeves suffered from a form of severe mental illness and was not taking medication at the time of the robberies. In a recent interview with the Panagraph at the jail, Reeves said his left leg was partially paralyzed and other wounds to his side and stomach were not healed when he was transferred to the jail May 16th, after two months at a local hospital. Reeves credits the jail medical staff with his ability to walk. A long scar in the back of his right hand marks where a bullet went through his palm. Bullets to his stomach cause permanent damage that requires ongoing care. Reeves' nearly year-long stay in the jail is an example of the difficulty encountered by the sheriff's department housing long-term mentally ill suspects. Reeves was ultimately transferred to a state mental health facility for an evaluation. If a determination is made that he needs further treatment, he could be held up to 30 years. McLean County Chief Judge Beth Robb appeared before the county's chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union. She described how judges are finding alternatives to sending the mentally ill to prison. She termed this approach therapeutic justice. So once you have the conference of chief justices recognizing a problem solving court concept, it gives us a little bit more credibility. Um, and you start to read in the literature uh, is the use of social services, behavioral health treatment for addiction and mental health disorders. And again, changing terminology, you're going to see the term behavioral health a lot more frequently now referring to both substance abuse and mental health disorders. The last couple of years, SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Agency, a federal agency, has identified the need to train all those individuals who interact with people in the criminal justice system in a way that recognizes many of these people have had trauma-related incidents in their lives. The CDC calls those things adverse childhood events, uh, seeing a family member shot, uh, physical sexual abuse, uh, being born with cocaine in your system. All of these things are adverse childhood events which can cause trauma. These are 19, 2010 numbers, but the cost to incarcerate an adult in our prisons was then 22,000. For juveniles, it was close to 70,000 per year. Community-based treatment can be as low as 5,900 a year. You do the math. I don't do math. <laughs> <laughs> I can figure that out. With Recovery Court, that was established in 2011. We have 11 graduates. It's a smaller number of participants. Drug court hovers around 45 participants at any one time. The recovery court, it's more 20 to 25. But since then, we've had 11 graduates. The recidivism rate, 3 out of 11, 27%. Again, that's a pretty good and successful rate. 42-year-old Randy Reeser is serving a two-year sentence under the supervision of McLean County's Recovery Court. Reeser suffers from a mental illness condition that makes it difficult to find and keep adequate housing. With the help of Recovery Court team members, Reeser has been able to find a place to call home. He continues to meet the requirements of Recovery Court 
and will likely be one of the program's success stories. What I like most about it is peaceful over here. You know, I'm happy. You know, I've been blessed with a beautiful home. I've been blessed with two beautiful cats. You know, I've been blessed with wonderful family. I've been blessed with Melissa and Mike here. Right, and I like the safety net. I like the recovery court because they're not about throwing you in jail every time you do something peddly, you know, like drinking or smoking marijuana, you know, they're not about throwing you in jail or in, uh, chestnut, you know, you know, and like Mr. Heiss said yesterday over the phone, you know, you need to be at home with your cats. Your cats need you at home, not in jail. You know, you told me yesterday over the phone, you're not jail material. Mr. Heiss and Jason, you know, and Jared, I love them all three like they're brothers, you know. Heck, they brought me over a bike a brand new bike, so I could ride it on the trail since I live right next to it, you know, and, you know, they're kind-hearted people, you know, that they didn't want this career, you know, this line of work, they would never have been in it, but they're in it for a reason, they're in it to help people, help better their lives and make them realize, hey, you are going down the wrong path. Uh, everybody's in this program, in essence, voluntarily. You all kind of signed up for the program, and, and for good reason. Uh, it's basically to make sure that um, repeated trips into the justice system don't continue into the future, and you wanted some assistance in getting your lives um, put back together a little bit to help you be more successful down the road, which I think is fantastic. You know, there have been some things that have been occurring that aren't really consistent with the program. There's been uh, uh, alcohol use, there's been drug use, there have been missed meetings. Uh, all, of this are, all of these are things that aren't consistent with successfully completing the program or they don't really help you or assist you in getting to where you want to be with your life. And so I'm going to talk about that, but I want you to all understand that this program is designed to help you. We do whatever the client needs. Um, we do transports, we do one-on-ones, we teach groups, um, we do home visits, whatever it is that the clients need, we're like their ch cheerleader. I love the team, I do, you know, they, and they do a lot of kind deeds for people. And like I told Judge Butler last Friday, you know, I told him, you know, you do a lot of kind deeds for people in the community, and he does, you know, he donates to charity organizations, different organizations. You know, judges, you know, these McLean County judges, they're people like us, you know. They're not perfect. You know, none of us are. We're no better or no worse from anybody. Um, well, they look at the benefits, things that they can get out of, um, get out of recovery court. Um, sometimes we help them with their laundry, we might even teach them how to sort out laundry, take them to the laundromat, transports, um, doctor's appointments, um, we give them rides to meetings, sometimes we attend meetings with them. So um, I think that they look, really look forward to the like companion or friendship. A, a lot of people don't want to live with the stigma of mental illness so they will go out and self-medicate uh, because it makes them feel better. Uh, a lot of times what we find is that they don't know why. They don't, you know, and, and I think that's why we're here to help them understand that you self-medicate simply because you'd rather self-medicate and not have that stigma than go ahead and be in like recovery court or be in somewhere and get your meds and, and be stable. What I am looking forward to down the road is attending each one of your graduations from this program or each one of you successfully completing this program, each one of you being successful in life. That's, that's my personal goal for each one of you. A lot of our clients have never experienced someone caring or um, having concerns for them um, a lot of our clients is just like have been a throwaway. So, with all of that having been said, let's get started. How's it going, Randy? Pretty good. Good. There you go.
Excellent. Thank you. All right. You're doing good today, aren't you? Yeah, I know. Yes, I am. You are doing good. I've been up early, early, early this morning listening to country music to this Blake Shelton. So you're a country music guy, is that what yes, you're telling me? Blake Shelton, uh, Moraine Lambert, Darius Rucker, and listening to all the great country music tunes. That's that's excellent. And you're you're also currently taking your meds, right? Yeah, I've been taking my meds. All right, so make sure that's that's really important. Well, you're gonna... the doctor's working with me. Uh, mm -hmm. This doctor, I believe, he took me off my shots and the Depreco. Now the only thing I'm on is uh, Seroquel XR and Cogentin. Mm -hmm. Cogentin and Seroquel aren't even uh, psychotropic drugs. All but... right, well make sure you keep doing what the doctors are telling you to do. Well, they help um, sleep at night too. So, so okay, so there's. I gotta sleep at yeah. And and that's a good thing. So you're you're currently you're complying with the terms of the program. And I think um, when I first met you, you were struggling a little bit with that, yes, you know. Was. But but now you it seems like you you want to be here. That's yes, what I'm I told. Do. You're taking your meds, yes. and what I want you to do is continue to back up your words with your actions oh, okay I, so you're gonna you're I'm gonna right. keep working hard um you're going to group you're you're really doing well right now so that was four things that i just ticked off that you're really doing well wow cool there you go well, here you get a gold star well, well yes you do thank well, you, you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you excellent okay. excellent i'm gonna put that right here <laughs> Excellent job, my boy. Well, I appreciate that, and I've, as uh, I think you know, or at least I told you, uh, the last two weeks ago when I saw you, that um, I was going to make sure I got a picture of your cats. I have that. But what about the old pictures of the old black? Well, let me show you what I have, and you tell me what I've got. Here's what I have right now, and um, if there's if there's another one that I need, yeah. well, I'll get a picture of that. One, it's a black and white picture of the old okay i don't have that one yet but i'll make a point to get that one um i want you to i want you to give me an assurance uh, now I I, and um, i want to report that you haven't used any alcohol okay cool. and i want to report that you haven't used any illegal drugs okay. and this goes for everybody um, and and next time i speak to you it'll be two weeks I want you to um, have another, this was a four-star week, how about a five-star week next time, okay? okay? Cool. All right, Randy. Bye -bye. Good job. <laughs> Tell me well, something. The main upstairs to have a life off of Elo, you know. Well, thank you, Randy. And, be blessed and, for your hard work. Thank you. Uh, you have a great week, all right? All right. Thanks, Randy. After successfully completing the past week's goals, Associate Judge William Yoder handed Recovery Court participant Randy Reeser four gold stars. Reeser thanked the Recovery Court team for their assistance by returning the stars to those who had helped him. After months of study and input from citizen advisory groups, the McLean County Health Department made a commitment to partially fund the construction of a crisis stabilization center. The board gave deferred funding of $400,000 to Chestnut Health Systems. The award was still short of the funding needed to open the mental health center. Um, we have six organizations that requested funding. All of these organizations we had had funding relationships with in the past. All six programs made and met the application uh, requirements and guidelines for funding. The health department funding coming forward, or the county monies coming out of the levy itself, was never intended, nor does they have the capability, to sustain a mental health system. That would give Starting in October of 2014, the Center for Human Services boosted its crisis intervention response to put two workers on each shift. PATH was awarded a contract to monitor the expanded program and follow up with those who receive crisis services. Because one of the things that the Board of Health heard loud and clear 
when we were looking at behavioral health funding is the community wanted to have a good crisis response programming. They wanted to have the ability to get crisis stabilization funding in the community. And they wanted, again, to make sure that we had good documentation, we had outcomes which we could measure, and we wanted to make sure that this upcoming fiscal year not only had the ability to fill some holes, unfortunately, with the limitation we have with dollars, we cannot fund everybody at the request level. So we determined we would have to not fund any new programming requested in the community except for crisis stabilization. You're asking what was the tipping point for the community to get involved in this. And I certainly think the, the sheriff had a lot to do with it. And the sheriff asking for uh, help from the National Institute of Corrections in, in the Justice Department had a lot to do with it. And when the county saw that report and, and understood the gravity of the circumstances, I think that really was the tipping point. McLean County probably is not unique in that the problem exists everywhere. That said, McLean County may have been a little bit slow. And, and when I refer to McLean County, I'm, I'm talking about kind of all elements of the county, not just the county government. Um, uh, so the service providers, the, the police agencies, may have been a little bit slow to the game on the topic of mental health and behavioral health. Um, and there's probably a lot of reasons for that. I think the county stepped up, uh, whether it was Chairman Sorensen, Bill Wasson, the county administrator, uh, others in the administration, members of the county board committees, they're the ones who recognized the, the potential uh, d deficiencies that are, that are being delineated within that report, realized the scope of the problem for McLean County and the risks the county was taking. A lot of us look at kind of our, our world here in McLean County, Bloomington Normal, and there's a little bit of a of a kind of a Pollyannic set of set of glasses or a view on this rose color, colored glasses, in that in that we we have a tendency to not want to see some of these kinds of things until they frankly become so self-evident that we don't don't have a choice. Citing federal reports critical of care for the mentally ill in McLean County, the state of Illinois awarded Chestnut Health Systems with a $700,000 grant to open a crisis stabilization center. Appearing before an enthusiastic crowd of healthcare professionals and city and county officials, Illinois Governor Pat Quinn said the award represented Illinois' willingness to come together and take care of those with mental illness. Quinn made the award in the very Chestnut facility that would be transformed into the 14-bed stabilization center in Bloomington. Yeah, how are you? Hi. Okay. Everybody? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Quite a day here today. It just so happens that tomorrow is the 51st anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King speaking the immortal I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And uh, to me, that's why we're here, because uh, we got a, kind of a notice from uh, the federal government or folks taking a look at things here and said, you know, we need to do some improvement in the area of mental health care and making sure we take good care of those who sometimes maybe are in the emergency room or perhaps even in the county jail. And they really don't belong there. And uh, it is important that all of us in Illinois, in every county, understand how me important mental health care is and how important it is to make sure we take care of those who might have substance abuse challenges. And um, our state believes in that, and we want to invest in that. Uh, we think that's the best way to have a better and more decent society. So I'm here today to announce that we're going to invest $700,000 right here in McLean County to set up a very important program with respect to uh, services for those. And uh, we want to thank Chestnut, uh, that is our partner on this uh, mission. I was just yesterday in the Metro East in Madison and St. Clair County. Chestnut's been there for quite some time. Uh, they have some experience here in McLean County, and they're coming to this county uh, to help out and to do something really important for all of us, to make our, our, our state and our county here in McLean a better place. Uh, it's very, very important that we are a family in Illinois. We're a big family of 13 million people, but we take care of each other. 
We are not a crowd of 13 million people. Everybody goes in their own separate direction. We are a community of shared values. That's what families are about. And Judy Buchanan, why don't you come forward and talk a little bit, if you would, uh, about uh, your situation and experience, and we appreciate you being here. Thank you, Governor. Oh, I, I'm very pleased and grateful to be here today. Some of you probably I've, I've worked with, I see a lot of familiar faces in a number of community projects, particularly dealing with mental health issues. Our family has been faced with the family member in serious crisis on multiple occasions. On one occasion, we were able to transport our loved one hundreds of miles away for treatment. And then unfortunately, on another occasion, due to the escalation of the crisis, in the absence of that immediate, accessible, and appropriate option, our family was unable to get the help we needed locally, so we were forced to handle the crisis virtually on our own. To our loved one and to our entire family, this was awful. Our family was in crisis mode with limited support. Now I'd be very remiss, particularly as I look around at some of our other partners, this county does have many valuable resources available to those who need mental health care. But this center will offer one important option not previously available. I am grateful to Chestnut, their community partners, our state partners, and you, Governor. These partnerships, and more importantly, recognition of their importance, are crucial to ensuring that our community can respond in an appropriate and timely manner. The quality of life we all want will be enhanced. I am familiar with Chestnut's Crisis Stabilization Center in Southern Illinois, and I'm especially pleased, and I will admit relieved, that this county will finally have a safe place for those in crisis, when such a center is the most appropriate place to be. Thank you. All right, well, well said, great. <laughs> We saw this, this this gradual stepping up in the progress of my son from Chester to the point where he came home, <clears throat> and then as we went to visit him, we were allowed it a couple of times, uh, Wednesdays and Saturdays, I believe, to see him here, and we saw this little this little bit by little bit this regression, and we were really very cognizant of that. And uh, his public defender, we were in touch with regularly. Um, and said so we need to get this moving along as quickly as we can. I was in recovery court a couple of years ago. I didn't make it through that. Um, secondary probation is a new type of probation. It's like a, a less invasive form of recovery court. They had me um, going to psychosocial rehabilitation, which is um, it's pretty fun. I, yeah, I get um, I get like little groups like we go to McDonald's, have coffee talk. Um, just they work with you and alongside you rather than work, you know, like in you. I guess I don't I don't know how to put it. Yeah, and then rather than talk at you, I I, I kind of want to have like my own house. I want to have you know my own stuff. I want I want to make my parents proud of me and. I'm more hands-on, that's why I want to be an electronic engineer, so I can actually like, take things apart and put them back together with, with new, innovative uh, uh, uses, I guess. Everybody cry.